here, and I'm really glad that uh, so many of you have shown up. And I hope that what Paul and I have to say is useful and helpful. Um, you know, neither Paul or I are market timers, so that means we haven't changed our presentation for the the strange events of the world that are going on right now. Um, we, we don't change our recommendations when the market's up or the market's down or assets are in favor or out of favor. So I, I, I guess bear with us and save some of your questions for the end because there may be some that really have to do with what's going on in the world at this very moment and we'll try to answer those when we get there. Uh, what I'm going to talk about for the next 45 minutes is two funds for life and it really is the simplification of the strategy that Paul advocates. And, uh, you know, it, th that's why it kind of makes sense for him to go first, but you, you'll get it. I'm sure you're all smart and clever and you'll be able to follow it. Um, Paul recommends something called the ultimate buy and hold portfolio that has 10 different asset classes in it. And uh, as much as we like it and it per has performed well historically, there's a lot of people for whom that's just too complicated. And so we, we wanted to come up with something that would have broader appeal and be easier to use. And that led us to work on this thing we called Two Funds for Life. Um, it's basically built on a foundation of a target date fund. And we'll, we'll talk about how that works. We'll talk about um, uh, you know, all the background that I think you need. So the outline for this presentation is roughly as follows. First, we're going to talk about target date funds, which are essentially supposed to be one fund for life. We'll talk about what they're supposed to do, what they actually do, and then we'll go into a question. How could a second fund maybe help? How could it help young investors in particular? And then that was really the initial work we did. Uh, from that, we will then go into um, what about people who want to retire early, or what about people who are on the verge of retirement or already retired? Could this same approach be relevant to them? And as part of that, we'll talk about ways that you can test your plan. And finally, we will finish with some uh, loose ends and next steps. So target date funds. Uh, you know, target date funds are pretty ubiquitous. That doesn't mean everybody on this call is using one, but I think it's fair to say that if you're not using one, you probably know somebody who is. And the reason I can say that is that uh, in various studies that have been done, they've found that approximately 77% of people with 401k accounts hold target date funds in those accounts. And in Vanguard's programs, um, they've, they've shown numbers as high as 50% of participants have all of their money in target date funds. So that's a, a very large amount of the market and it represents over $1.7 trillion invested. Uh, Vanguard is the, the, line, the, the elephant in the room, if you will, when it comes to target date funds. They own over 37% market share. I think that's more than double the, the next largest target date fund provider. Um, so these are really an important part of the way young people are saving for the future and preparing for retirement today. So it's important for us to look at what they do and whether they're serving the needs of their investors as best as possible. So what is a target date fund um, and, and what principle is it built on? If you, uh, if you wanna think about it in a really simple way, I think of them as they're, they're like a robo advisor on the cheap, right? They're, they're like a robo advisor for the masses. They collect a, a very wide range of asset classes. So it's a very diversified portfolio into something that's very easy to buy. You buy it based on the year when you think you're going to retire. So let's say you think you're gonna retire in 2040. You would look for a target date fund that was labeled the 2040 target retirement fund from Vanguard, for example, or T. Rowe Price, they would have one, or Fidelity, lots of different companies have target date funds. But the key there is that by picking a single number, the year when you're going to retire, you get a massively diversified fund that's going to adjust over time in a way that is appropriate for you for the age that you're at and the year in which you're going to retire. 
And it's all built on this idea that we have human capital that declines with time. When we're young, around, say, entering the workforce at age 25, we have 40 years to work, 40 years for compounding to work for us, to have investments grow. Um, if we lose our whole net worth at the age of 25, for most of us, we're not losing very much. And it's relatively easy to recoup and come back from that, that problem. If we lose our whole net worth at the age of 65, it's a totally different story. We don't have a lifetime to work. We don't have a lifetime for investments to work on our behalf. So when you, when you uh, draw that in a curve over on the left-hand side, what you see is you have a lot of human capital early in your career and you exchange for money as you go through your career. Hopefully you get paid uh, for the work and the labor that you put in. And you also get compensated for the time that your investments can work for you. And that capital goes down over time. And so if you look on the right-hand side at how a target date fund deals with that, what it does is it starts out with a lot in risky assets, which are typically equities or, or stocks, collateral stocks. And you can see that there's some large caps, some small caps, some US, some international, some emerging markets. And it transitions to less risky assets over, over time. So as, as you move to the right, this is the industry average curve as of a couple of years ago. Uh, as you move to the right, uh, you get more bonds, which tend to be safer, right? So we looked at this and we said, well, you know, that looks really interesting. How would we test to see if the glide path, which is what's on the right, those changing assets over time, if the glide path is doing what it's supposed to do? And usually what you would do to test something like that is you would create a back test. And that's essentially what we did. But there's a tricky part to this back test. You can't just go back to 1970 and buy a target retirement fund or, or model a target uh, retirement fund that's going to go for 40 years because some people would have been early in the target retirement fund. Some people would have been retiring sooner. Some people would have been retiring later. So what we did instead is for every single year, we modeled every different point in the target retirement fund. And we did that for every month starting in 1970 all the way up through when we did this analysis through 2017. And if there wasn't enough time to get to retirement, we looped back. We used something called circular bootstrapping. So if, if you had uh, a 40 year plan and you started in uh, 2010, when you get to 2017, you're running out of returns, we'd go back to 1970. And you can debate whether that's realistic or not, but it's the only way to really get a lot of data on this asset class that's changing over time. And once we had done that, once we created the model, uh, we, we looked at how much risk, and we measured risk by drawdown, you would see at different ages. So at age 25, um, when you just start, you can't have a drawdown because you don't have a balance. But by the time your balance is built up a little bit, you see with a fixed lump sum investment, that's what's modeled on this slide, you quickly climb up to where you could have a maximum drawdown of about 50% in a typical target date fund. And that stays flat until you're at about the age of 40 and then it declines to age 65. And the different colors here in this charter, the, the different grays represent uh, less frequent and more frequent drawdowns. So the black bar at the bottom is the kind of drawdown you might see every quarter. The uh, dark gray is what kind of a drawdown you might see every year and so forth on up the chart. So you stand back and you look at it and it looks like it's doing what it's supposed to do, right? Um, starts out with a high risk, drops down to a low risk. But there's a problem with this. Very few of us start with a lump sum investment, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I did not start with my lump sum investment for retirement when I was 25 years old. My account balance was really small. So we said, well, what happens to this curve if you look at somebody who starts out with zero and accumulates every year? And all of a sudden things look totally different. Um, and this is really interesting. Now, we're looking at somebody who is starting out with a, a, a zero balance 
and they're adding on a monthly basis the same amount of money increasing with inflation throughout their career. And what you see is that all the way up to age 40, you're slowly climbing up to that peak risk. Um, but for all of those early years, when remember you have this great capacity for risk because you've got all those years to work ahead of you, you have very little risk. In fact, you have less risk at the age of 26, 27 than you will have at the age of 65 with that big chunk of fixed income or bonds in your portfolio, which just seems totally backwards. In fact, I was trying to come up with an analogy for this. And so the image I came up with was that um, actually, I, I'll, I'll go to that image in just a second. Let's, let's take a look at how, um, how that drawdown gets reduced in the early years, right? So why is it that somebody contributing regularly doesn't see a big drawdown? And the reason is that as the market goes down, say January to February, and let's say it's off by 5%, um, you're going to make a new contribution that next month and it's going to hide the drawdown. Now, did you experience a loss of capital? Yes, you did. But are you aware of that loss of capital? And Paul, Paul has made it clear to me that in all the years when he was advising um, young investors, many of them would come to him and say, you know, the market's off by 50%, but I've hardly seen any drawdown at all. And that's because they're regularly contributing. And you can see that here where the lump sum investment is shaded out and it shows this big drawdown in 1975, but the monthly contribution experience um, only shows about a 10% drawdown in that same year. Now, as you get farther out in time, those contributions don't make as much of a difference, right? But they are protecting a young investor from seeing the extremes of the market drawdown. And, and that protection um, makes it so putting bonds in the early portfolio to give an, a young investor that added protection is really over protection. And I like to think of it like this. You have a young investor who is, they're, they're like a track athlete who's really ready for the race. You know, they're young, they're fit, they're capable, they're trained. And putting bonds in their portfolio is like putting boots on them for added protection. It's going to slow them down. It's going to reduce the end balance that they see. And it's going to reduce the drawdowns that they see very little because they already are protected so much by the contributions that they're making. <clears throat> so the next question was, how could we improve? What could we do for somebody to make it so their experience would be better? And uh, the first thought we had was, what if we took a portion of the savings that somebody's going to be setting aside for their retirement and put it in a second fund that took some added risk, risk that uh, historically has been prudent and shown to, to produce a higher return, so probably in equities and maybe in a, a fund that has multiple factors working for it, like small and value. And so we looked at what would happen if you took somebody who's in this Vanguard-like target date fund and put 10% into a second fund and didn't rebalance, just a second account, or 20% or 30%. And what would happen not just to the end balance, but also the inflation-adjusted end balance, the worst drawdown, the worst drawdown at age 65, um, and even the graphs. And so that's what you can see here. And if you focus for a second on the end balance, you can see um, that there's a low, a median, and a high. Uh, and so for the Vanguard-like target fund, that ranged from 3.5 to 7.9 to $12.8 million. And by adding the 10% small cap value, first of all, the bottom goes up, right? So the worst case scenario went from 3.49 to 3.9. Um, the median goes from 7.9 million to 10.3 million, and the maximum went from 12.8 million to 8.2 million. So that looks like an interesting strategy. It looks like something that at least history says would serve you well. Um, the 20% is going to do more. So, you know, the median goes up to 12.7 and this, you know, doing 30% into small cap value, even more, you're up to 15, but there's a problem. And um, some of you are probably already pointing at the screen if you notice the problem. Um, 
if you look at the right hand side of these curves, when you're approaching retirement and you really want to know how much money you have to go into retirement, um, the uncertainty in the amount of money that you have is going up. The amount of drawdown you might experience on the right hand side of the curve is much higher. So with a Vanguard like target date fund at age 65, that worst case scenario was 26%. But now looking at these others, you go to 37%, 45%, and 50%. So as much as this looks like it might be helpful, um, it would be nice to come up with a way to help add risk in those early years, but not add risk in the later years. And so that was the next, the next step. And what we proposed and tested was this idea that you would scale the second fund with age. And this is essentially the core of the two fund for life strategy. So instead of just taking a fixed 10% and putting it into the second fund, um, you would take 1.5 times your age. So if you're 20 years old, 1.5 times 20 would be 30. You change that into a percentage and you put that into a second fund and the rest, or, or I'm sorry, you put that into the target date fund and you put the rest into the second fund, right? So at age 20, you'd be putting 30% into the target date fund and 70% into one of the other asset classes on, these, on this slide. And now if you look at the graphs at the bottom, which are plotting how that risk changed with time, they all taper off as you go to the right, but we're pulling more risk, which also is leading to more return into the left-hand side of the chart. And so you can, you can look at the end balance range and the end balance, the worst case end balances are still improving as you move from left to right across the chart. Um, the median end balance, uh, if you use large cap value as the, uh, the second fund, it goes from 7.9 million to 9.8 million. If you use small cap blend, it would go from 7.9 to 9.6 million. I'm rounding a little bit here. Um, uh, if we go over to small cap value, it goes from 7.9 million to 11.5 million. Um, and if you really wanted to be aggressive, uh, over on the far right, we modeled what would happen if you used a bigger multiplier. So 2.5 times age minus 25. Um, that means that you ramp from 100% in the second fund at age 25 down to 0% in the second fund at age 65. Um, and that one gives you 13.8 um, million as the median end balance. And again, the, the chart, uh, the, uh, the risk is ramping down as you go to the right. So, so this is, I, I think for many people, an interesting way to look at investing. Um, we know, we know from the research that a lot of people who use target date funds do use a second fund and they don't have much advice in terms of how to choose that second fund or what the second fund is going to do or how to manage the risk. And so, you know, our goal in developing two funds for life was to provide a strategy that allows people to have a very diversified portfolio that's automatically managed that really only in fund uh, involves buying two things. You buy a target date fund, the second fund of your choice, and then on an, on an annual basis, you do a very simple piece of arithmetic and rebalance. So I, it, it, the target date fund is simpler still, but this is pretty simple. So the question then comes up though, um, you know, what's the catch? It, there, there's no such thing as free money. So what's the price I have to pay to these strategies work for me? And uh, I like to think of this of a short journey or a long journey, right? So if I get in my car and I've got a journey from Stan's Donut Shop in Santa Clara to the Googleplex, uh, which is in Mountain View, it's a few miles, and I pull up Google Maps, it's gonna tell me that's gonna take about 30 minutes during rush hour. Um, you know, it's gonna give me an, ad an advice to take a particular route that's a minute shorter than the other route. Do I know that that's the shortest route? Not really. You know, many of us have started down a path to find out uh, that Google Maps reroutes us, that it was the wrong one. But it's only 30 minutes, not that big a deal. So, you know, the uncertainty is not that big a deal either. But now if you look on the right-hand side and you say, well, I'm starting in uh, 
Sunnyvale and I bought Stan Donuts, Stan's Donuts for a long journey all the way to Fairbanks. So I probably bought two dozen. Um, this is going to take 60 hours of driving and Google Maps is going to give me multiple, multiple routes. You know, do I really know absolutely which path is the shortest one? You know, there, there could be a fire on that fastest route. So I don't absolutely know, but it's very, very likely that this route that's five, that's three hours shorter is going to be the fastest route. And so I can pursue it with great confidence. And even if there's an accident along the route, I'll probably stay committed to the route. And that's, that's the catch. With any of these strategies that take us off the beaten path to do something different, we have to be committed and stick with it. Because if we bail partway through, you know, if I get halfway to Fairbanks and double, double back to take one of the other routes, I can almost guarantee you it will be the longest route. Right. And the same thing is true with investing. If you pick a strategy that's different from what everybody else is doing and partway through you switch, then, you know, all bets are off. Right. So the, the catch is it requires discipline and commitment and consistency. So now the, the next question that came up once we produced this strategy is what about fire? What about people who want to retire early? And there's a really simple way to deal with fire, uh, at least in, in the case of this too fun for life planning. And that's that you just turn it around. So instead of looking at one and a half times your age, you take one and a half times the years to retirement. So now you take age out of the equation. So if I'm 30 and I'm saving super aggressively and I plan to retire at the age of 50, um, one and a half, so the difference between 30 and 50 is 20 years. I would take one and a half times, uh, I'm sorry, the difference between 50 and 30 is 20, yeah, 20 times one and a half is 30. So I would put that not in the target date fund, but the second fund. And um, so it, 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 uh, it's the same principle. It's just kind of flipping the equation around a little bit. And the follow-up question is how much of a difference does it make? And I'd love to tell you. Uh, the problem is that it depends. It depends on so much. It depends on uh, how old you are, how many years to retirement, how many years you'll be invested. But the same principles that make that strategy work for somebody who's 25 retiring at 65 should work in favor of somebody who is, uh, you know, on a fire, a financially independent retire early strategy. And, you know, there's no guarantees. Um, the future doesn't have to look like the past, but the only guide we have to the future is the past. And everything in the past that we've been able to analyze says that taking a little more risk in those early years is a good idea for most investors. Then, the follow-up question to that was, what if I'm already retired? Or what if I'm nearing retirement? And uh, I, don't, I don't know uh, this audience that well, but if it's like other AAII audiences we've spoken to, I suspect some of you are in this camp. And uh, again, the answer to this question is, it depends. It depends on whether you've undersaved, oversaved, or have just about the right amount. So how do we figure that out? Uh, I'm going to suggest that the 4% rule is still a good rule of thumb. Now, if you want to derate it to 3.5% and be more conservative, that's fine. But most of the research I've done and that other people have done suggests that for, for a traditional length of retirement, a 4% withdrawal rate is reasonably safe with a diversified portfolio of investments. So the way to figure out whether you've undersaved, oversaved, or just right is to figure out, first of all, what do you need to live on? How much are your living expenses? Um, second of all, how much do you get from other sources like social security, pension? Um, uh, it could be you have an annuity, right? I mean, you, you, you may have any one of a number of different ways to get additional income. Then you take your expenses minus those additional funds and say, okay, how much do I need to be taking out of my nest egg, my investments every month? And you figure out what that rate is by dividing the amount you would be taking out. Um, I'm sorry, I said every month, but on an annual basis divided by the total. 
If it's greater than 4%, you've undersaved. If it's right about 4%, you're just right. And if it's less than 4%, you've oversaved. Um, so if we use those guidelines, then what does that tell us you should do, right? Well, if you've undersaved and your withdrawal rate is greater than 4%, um, I would suggest you see a financial planner. And even if you're in the other camps and you're nearing retirement, I still might suggest you see a financial planner. Um, we, we didn't really know how this was all going to work out when we were retiring. And it was a great comfort and a great help to see a financial planner and have them uh, provide a, an independent perspective on whether our expenses and our withdrawal rate and our investment strategy were prudent. So um, I think seeing a financial planner is good for any, any of these categories, but if you've undersaved, I would definitely see a financial planner. I wouldn't lose hope because um, there's usually a path forward, but it will probably require some creativity and I won't be able to give you a, boil, a boilerplate answer, um, nor will Paul or probably anybody else. If your withdrawal rate is right about 4%, so you've saved just the right amount, then a 100% target date fund is, is likely just fine. It's what they're designed for, it's prudent. Um, if anything, it might be a little bit conservative, but for people who are just retiring, a lot of times being a little bit conservative is not a bad thing because it's a really uncertain time. I remember my wife at that point uh, being nervous. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fine. And if your withdrawal rate is less than 4%, so you've oversaved and you could spend more, uh, that, uh, well, you, you have choices. You could spend more. So you could take your 3% uh, expense rate and turn it into 4% by spending an additional 33%. Um, or you could take the extra and put it into a second fund for legacy or for charity or for it. The bottom line is you have money you don't need within your lifetime. And so that gives you some flexibility and attitude. Now, if you were watching carefully, what you're looking at here is a strategy that says you start out with money in a second fund when you're young, you ramp it down to retirement, and if you've oversaved, you ramp it back up, right? Which seems kind of odd. It's like, why would you do that? And I'm gonna go back to this comment I made about um, right at the point of retirement, you have this huge uncertainty. You have a lot of questions about where money's gonna come from. You're going from a regular paycheck to a new lifestyle. And um, that was when my wife came to me and said like three months into retirement, where is our money gonna come from? Um, and it was very ner nerve wracking. Now we've been retired for three, almost four years. At this point, we're both pretty calm. Um, so your own ability to take emotional risk, I think changes in retirement. And that's why I think right at retirement, um, just leaving a, a prudent target date fund allocation for many people is fine. For others, they may wanna take more risk. It's kind of up to you. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. So um, before we think about adding that second fund in retirement, I wanna just give you a mental model about how, uh, how we drive our retirement accounts. They're not like, they're not like sports cars, right? It's not like you you get in the car and you say, okay, I'm going to have a different investment allocation today and tomorrow I'll see a different financial performance. I mean, um, it actually takes many, many years for us to see the effects of our portfolio choices. And um, so I, I think it's interesting to think about how NASA drives the rover on Mars because at any point in time, the rover on Mars is between three and 22 radio minutes from Earth or light minutes from Earth. Uh, if they decided to try and drive it like you drive a sports car, um, it, would be, um, imp it would be impossible because the, the thing they would be seeing back from the rover in terms of what was in front of the rover would, would have happened anywhere from six to 44 minutes ago, right? From when they turned the wheel, so to speak. So what they do to prevent crashing the rover is they get very, very careful about modeling the instructions they're going to send to the rover and testing it on the ground here on the earth before they send those instructions up to the rover. And I think that same principle is a great one to apply to our investing, especially 
as we're nearing or in retirement. And uh, there's a way to do that through a tool at Portfolio Visualizer that I think is, is really powerful. This is a free tool. Any of you can use it. I'm going to give you instructions on how to use it on this slide, as well as links to some sample um, scenarios that I've already set up. Those show up on the following slides. If you go to Portfolio Visualizer, um, if you look on the bottom left-hand part of this, um, this slide, you'll see a highlighted financial goals area. And that financial goals area, if you click on that, it gives you the ability to set up a changing asset allocation. So you can model what's happening in the target date portfolio. You could even add your second fund if you want. You can set up um, the withdrawals that you're going to be making. You can set up the number of years it's going to run. And then it runs a Monte Carlo simulation and it gives you an idea of the range of things based on history that you might see in the future. Um, I think of it as it's kind of like the test drive of the rover, right? So before you change your portfolio, you can go test drive the instructions you're going to send to your portfolio. And what you get back are um, charts that look like this, right? Now, I know you won't be able to read all of these charts and I, I apologize for that, but I, I want you to focus primarily on the numbers that I've added at the top of the charts. So for the, the chart on the far left, um, the numbers are 0, 0.8 million, 4.3 million. The chart in the middle is zero to 2.7 million and the chart on the right is zero to 1.1 million. And what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at three different examples of where we start with a million dollars in an account and we take out different percentages, take out either 3% on the left, 4% in the middle, or 5% on the right, and we do increase that with inflation. So these are a traditional way of thinking about a fixed withdrawal rate. And they help show why the 4% fixed withdrawal rate is safe. So if you look at the left, the 3% fixed withdrawal rate has this really nice attribute that um, not only are you unlikely to run out of money, but it, you're very likely to increase the amount of money that you have invested with time. It's kind of trending up into the right. If you look at the one in the middle, with the exception of the very bottom curve, uh, which runs out of money at about 31 years, uh, they, they all survive to the end and, and you know, they, they trend kind of sideways, which is why that 4% withdrawal rate is perceived as safe for, for retirees because very few retirees are going to be retired more than 30 years, right? Now, if you're an early retiree, you may want to go with a 3.5% withdrawal rate or something because you think you're going to live longer, right? But if you look at the fixed rate over on the far right, the 5% withdrawal rate, uh, very few of those actually make it all the way to the end. Um, well, at more than half, but still there's a about a third 34%, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, only 34% make it all the way to the end to 35 years. So yeah, it is well under half make it. Um, and that's a failure most wouldn't tolerate retirement. So uh, this model, when you input your own variables, can help you determine a, well, you know, what kind of range of balances should I expect to see over time? You know, it's probably going to go up and down. And B, what likelihood do I have that I'm going to survive? And perhaps most importantly, you know, I, you can do a test with what you currently have and a test with a newer different allocation and see if it increases your chances of survival, increases your median end balance, et cetera, right? So we looked at this in terms of the two fund for life strategies. Um, I'm going to skip the variable withdrawals here. <clears throat> so let's look at somebody who's an oversaver and they only need to take out 3%, right? They only need to take out. So that means that effectively they have an extra bucket. They have three buckets um, that represent the one they're going to retire on and a fourth bucket that's the same size or 25% of their portfolio that's available for legacy, if you will. So what happens if you take that 25% and you invest it in large cap value or in small cap value? Well, the baseline on the left-hand side would be to put it all in the target date fund and your end balances are between 0.8 million and 4.3 million. 
if you take 25% and you put it into the large cap value fund, your worst case doesn't get any worse. It goes up a little bit, but the best case and the median case go up quite a bit, right? And if you invested that 25% in small cap value, um, the worst case roughly doubles and the best case roughly triples. Now this is over um, 35 years. Most of us probably won't be retired for 35 years, but still it gives you an idea that if you have money um, that is for a future generation, you can take a little bit more risk with it and there's a good chance it's gonna help that future generation benefit uh, in a really meaningful way. Now, I, I also mentioned you might apply this strategy if you're a just enough saver. Uh, so let's say you've been retired for a little while, you've gotten comfortable with the idea that there is a way to pay the bills and you want to take a little bit more risk. Well, what I've modeled here is what would happen if you took 10% out of the target date fund and put it into small cap value or took 20% out and put it into small cap value. And what you see is the curves at the bottom or the, 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 uh, the failure rate uh, don't really change very much. So it's not like that risk is hurting you. Uh, the target date fund runs out uh, in the 10th percentile at about 31 years. If you take 10% into small cap value, it's still about 31 years, 20% it's still, it's actually a little bit better, but still about 31 years. So, so the worst case isn't getting significantly worse or even meaningfully worse, but the median is going up and the end balance is going up. So even for a just enough saver, taking more risk in retirement is something they may want to consider. So uh, before we get to questions and answers, I just want to preempt a few of them. Um, you know, which specific funds should I use? People have asked when we're updating the best in class ETFs uh, at Paul Merriman. So first of all, they're there. You can go to paulmerriman.com and see our best in class ETF recommendations and use them for any of these strategies. Uh, we aim to update those about once every two years. So uh, we should be updating them towards the beginning of 2021. And the reason I do that at every two years is, first of all, the, the, the individual fund choices you make are far less impactful than the asset class, class choices you make. They don't change that much. And second of all, we don't want people trading too often because there's expenses associated with that. Um, you know, you, if we updated them every six months, you might have short-term gains or something. So um, I, I think it makes sense to update them every two years. The second thing, let's see, could, it, could I use a few more funds to get more diversification? Sure. So any of these strategies, you could combine funds and be more diversified. Uh, can you use Portfolio Visualizer to model target date funds in the contribution years? Not yet. Um, I'm advocating for that, but you can't do it yet. And what's the biggest risk with this strategy? It's portfolio suicide. So uh, losing hope partway through and giving up and trading when the market's down and locking in your losses. That would be the worst, the worst thing you could do. And um, then finally, what if I don't care about complexity and want the ultimate target date for portfolio? We have a, a Merriman aggressive target date glide path and calculator on our website where you can customize a glide path and you can implement it with, um, I think it's 12 or 13 funds. So it's the opposite of simplicity. But if you're interested, there's an article on uh, how it performed in our back tests, as well as the tools to, to go and use it if you want to. Um, so that's, that's there for people who really wanna be a lot more involved. So uh, my, my uh, second to last slide here, just call to action. First of all, please recognize the resilience of young portfolios, whether it's yours, your child's, or somebody else's. Uh, young investors really have a tremendous opportunity ahead of them and they should take advantage of it. Second of all, you know, consider uh, two funds for life in your working years. And uh, you know, then third, as you approach retirement, um, calculate with your withdrawal rates and consider two funds in retirement. And then finally, regardless of where you are and what you're doing, test your plan, set your expectations, and then stick with it. And with that, I think I have a slide of just helpful links and um, we can go to, to questions. So Rob, I don't know, I haven't been watching the question panel. Do we have any questions? 
it looks like Rob is muted. Yep, I'm here. Ah, good. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we, we, there's a, a host of questions that came in. Um, I can start running through some of these, um, and we'll go to about, say, about 1020. Uh, okay. Sound good? Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Uh, first question, please discuss Advantis funds and the differences to DFA. Yeah, Avantis funds, and I don't know whether it's Avantis or Avantis, um, but they, they are really interesting because they're built on a lot of the same kinds of principles that DFA funds were built on, and they are more diversified than some of the ETFs that we've had access to. Uh, the two challenges I have with recommending them um, are that, number one, they don't have very much history because they've only been out for about six months. And number two, they, in some cases, don't have much liquidity. So you pay a higher bid ask spread to buy and sell them. Um, and that's just the, the nature of a new fund in the market. But we will be considering them when we do our next best in class ETF analysis. And a, a kind of a follow up question um, asked if Paul had added the Advantis International Small Cap ETF to the uh, recommended funds for the ultimate buy and hold uh, strategy. I, I, Paul, do you, you know, as far as we're concerned, you can hear me, I hope. Yes. Uh, as far as we're concerned, um, the, as far as the recommendations for the ultimate buy and hold, the list that Chris has created uh, represents what I think people should consider with the ETFs to fulfill all 10 of those asset classes. So, uh, and I might just add one other thing. Uh, our goal, I, when I was in the investment advisory business, uh, my old firm, and, and, and now the firm still does this, but they were basically DFA advisors. And my goal, my hope was that what Chris would be able to achieve is to put together a, a group of ETFs that look as close to what the DFA has created that would also give the investor, therefore, the, the chance of a return that would be close to being a DFA a client. And uh, all the testing so far that we've done uh, indicates that that best-in-class group is coming very, very close to uh, replicating the DFA. Uh, the difference being for a do-it-yourself investor is you don't have to pay uh, an investment advisor refer or a, a fee. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll just say one other thing about that. Um, and Paul kind of touched on it. When I choose the best in class funds, uh, I do make a compromise sometimes in terms of the fund match to the asset class. So it might not be the very best, for example, large cap blend iconic fund, but I do that in favor of having an ultimate buy and hold portfolio that's a better portfolio, right? So um, yeah, I, I do make choice. I, I favor the integrity of the overall portfolio over the individual fund being the best for the, the category that the fund sits in. Um, and so far, we've, we've done pretty well, I think, at coming up with, a, um, if you look, for example, at all the Morningstar style boxes, the, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio, when you combine all those funds together, it looks very close to a DFA, DFA portfolio constructed. Um, I wish I had access to the DFA funds. They're fantastic funds. Um, and the Avantis funds, I think, are closer than we've had in the past. So it's going to be fun to give them consideration next year. Okay, thank you. So mo moving on to the next one, kind of multi-part question here. Um, is it possible for your target date funds be available someday on TD Ameritrade? Yeah, pro probably not, but um, I, you know, I, not because we wouldn't do it, but because I think they would, we, they, there's nothing that would prevent them from copying them if they wanted to. So, and if they did, uh, that would be fine. Um, we, you know, we would celebrate it, but uh, I think that they have research departments a lot bigger than ours, and I'm sure they're confident they know how to do it. <laughs> well, and, and I think it might be added that uh, 
a major change that is likely to come within all of the major suppliers of ETFs is the ability to, to buy and sell uh, uh, percentage of shares. Uh, right now you have to, in most places, you have to trade a whole share. But uh, I think that, the, that ETFs will evolve to be treated the same way as, as regular mutual funds. And in fact, M1, we know, has, and several others have done that, where you can buy and sell uh, portions of a, of a share and rebalance with all, without having to do all the figuring out how many shares can I buy of this and that. You just, you just tell them how many dollars and you're going to get the number of shares for that many dollars. It's, it's going to be important uh, for this work that Chris has done uh, for us to be able to do that at TD Ameritrade, Schwab, Fidelity, and Vanguard. And, you know, just in the time since we did the initial two fund for life publication, we have seen more of the target date funds shift more towards an all equity position in the early years. So I, I think, uh, you know, that's, I, our name isn't on it and that's all fine and good, you know, but I, I think that the, the idea of taking a little more risk in those early years has resonated with some, some folks and it's starting to show up in funds. And I think T. Rowe Price has done that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they were, they were the ones that did it, I think, most aggressively. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Um, so the next question here says, if one maxed out their contributions in a retirement plan on any given year and had extra discretionary income to invest, what prudent vehicle can one invest extra money in a, in a target date fund sitting in a taxable account, a swing trend trade? Any info would be appreciated. You know, um, I would go to Paul's website and look at all of the different portfolios that Daryl has modeled, right? So uh, the fact that the person asked about prudent to me says they're favoring diversified, right? They don't want all their eggs in one basket. And uh, on Paul's website, Daryl has modeled um, 10 fund solutions, four fund solutions, uh, two fund solutions, all value solutions, you know, tilted to US solutions. So I, you know, I, by the way, Daryl, I noticed you activated your camera, but you're on mute. So if you have something to say on mute, but that's fine. Yeah. You're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving on, we still got a few more minutes. So uh, this is a, a bit of a long one, so bear with me here. Uh, says, I've been following your recommendations, Paul, for a well-diversified portfolio of index funds. Does the coronavirus pandemic change any of the underlying allocations? I think you touched on that, Chris, in your, your discussions. It says, I'm particularly questioning the current and future impact on real estate REITs, as well as my 40% cash bond portion of short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term treasury and corporate bond funds as well as international bond funds. Are these still part of the mix or have their allocations been changed to work with the new normal? You want me to take that one? Well, yeah, he, he said Paul. Well, okay. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, the, the question would be, uh, do we think that the work that Dr. Fama and Dr. French did that uh, talks about the, the factors of investing in, is the small cap premium a thing of the past? Is value a thing of the past? Uh, uh, and, and in all cases, they go through periods where it looks very obvious that they are a thing of the past. And as you probably know, Rob, back in the late 90s, the conclusion was small cap and value is dead. It's gone. There's no more premium. And then for the next 20 years, the small cap and value premium doubled the return of the S&P 500. So um, there's, no, there's not enough data to conclude that those asset classes that have historically been productive are, are going to stop. But remember, we got 10 of them. We know that one of the 10 is probably not going to make us happy. Another one of the 10 may make us very happy, and it might not be the one we expected. So there's massive diversification. Daryl, would you add anything to that? You've looked at all those numbers. Well, things, things go through periods of 
like you said, about performance and underperformance, and nobody knows what the future is going to hold. Uh, so I'm, I, you know, some things do die out. Look at the tulips in the 1600s. You know, they're no longer a big investment uh, draw. So, so things do happen. Um, nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. As Chris said earlier, the, about the only thing you can really, really gain insight with is looking in the past. Um, experts, economic experts, when they try to forecast what's going to happen in the next one, three, five, 10, 20 years, who knows? You know, their crystal balls are probably about as clear as ours. So uh, I think uh, I think that's that's kind of where I think about these things or how I think about these things. Um, jumping between strategies is probably not a good thing for the reasons Chris mentioned. And so uh, how long can you stand it, I guess, is what it boils down to. And that's the thing you need to think about when you develop your strategy to begin with and, and hopefully codify it in, a, in an investment portfolio statement or strategy. So you, so you have it down and, and you can go back and review it uh, periodically to, to see why you decided to do what you did and, uh, and go from there. So here's kind of a follow on question to that, talking about making changes. A uh, question came in that says, I'm already in retirement. Does it make sense for me to change my assets to a target date fund at this point? Chris? Yeah, I, um, if what you have is working for you, there's no, there's no urgency to change, right? You may have something. Target date funds, if you look at them in retirement, are stable. So it's gonna be a stable allocation that is heavily tilted towards fixed income. Um, so before I made the switch, if you know, I would definitely look at how, how does what you have compare to what you would be switching to. And um, being the analytical guy that I am, I'd go model it. So I'd, I'd, go, <laughs> I'd go test it and figure it out. But there's, no, there's nothing magic about a target date fund in retirement. Target date funds in retirement are really just a, a, um, a way to buy to conveniently in a single fund, buy a diversified portfolio. And they do come with expenses too, right? So uh, you can probably do the same thing cheaper on your own. Um, and whether it's worth it to you to manage that or not uh, is, is up to you. So I, I think it really depends, but there's nothing magic about the target date fund. It's just an allocation in retirement. I think the magic that's important though for people to think through at retirement, should I make a change? I'm gonna be talking in a few minutes about the fine tuning tables that are show the results of different combinations of equity and fixed income over long periods of time. And I would say anybody, in a sense, at any age, should know what risk are they taking inside of that portfolio. And if, if, if they find out that that is more risk than they have a stomach for, then yes, they should change because there's nothing more threatening than to start losing money when you're retired and you are the source of all your future salaries. And so we need to get that appropriate balance of equity and fixed income right when we're out of work. Okay. Um, why don't we take one more, Paul, before we move on to you, there's still a host of other questions. We'll try to get to them um, before the end, but uh, um, this last question, there's so much variability in target date funds. How do you pick a good one, Chris? You know, I haven't done a best in class target date fund selection. And the, re the reason I haven't is partly uh, it would be a good chunk of work. And partly I, I'm not sure it's not like most people can just pick and choose. A lot of times it's limited by the selection in your 401k. Um, if you do have the choice, I, I, in spite of the bonds in the early years, I like the expense ratio of the Vanguard funds, right? And I think you can compensate for the bonds in the early years by augmenting that strategy with something else. Uh, the T. Rowe Price funds, I like their glide path because they're more aggressive in the early years, but I haven't done a thorough analysis of their expense ratio and whether it, uh, you know, whether it's 
too high to offset the benefit you get for the added equity. So I, um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I would, I would look at expense ratio first. I'd look at diversification, um, and equity tilt early in the, in the glide path second. Those would be the things I would, would look at probably. Yeah. And if I could add one more, I would highly prefer an indexed portfolio over an actively managed one because uh, yeah, it's a given. There are more things that can go wrong in the, in, in essence, in the actively managed. Yeah, I didn't say that, but that, I just took that as a, a given. You're right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I have one ben. comment. Before we move on, I have one comment. Uh, it's a clarification, really, uh, on Chris's uh, presentation. And when he talks about fixed rates, I wanted to make sure people understood what fixed meant. What fixed means is that you start out with a 4% draw your first year, and then it's adjusted annually for inflation. So it's really fixed in terms of real dollars. Yeah. It, it's, but the actual nominal dollars or the actual number of dollars you take out every year changes. So it, it's kind of a, of a, it's oxymoron in that it, 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 it's, it's a fixed rate, but it's a variable number of dollars. So <laughs> that can be a little confusing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, why don't we move on, uh, Paul, if you want to give it another shot, see if we can get your screen up there. Chris, right, you now. may have to stop sharing first. Oh, yeah, I'll do that. I'll do that. And then now you have no idea how much anxiety I have right now. <laughs> this, is not, this is not easy. Uh, now I've hit share. I did that before. Now I look for the San Diego AAII. You hit that now. Now I've got it full. And we're, we're seeing it real perfectly, Paul. That is Works amazing. Great. That is amazing technology. All right. Well, Chris, you were great as always. These two gentlemen devote hundreds, not thousands, I don't think, but definitely hundreds of hours at no cost to our foundation in the hope of he helping people uh, do better with their investments. And that's all the Merriman Financial Education Foundation is about, helping people at all stages of life, from high school students all the way up to retirees. Now, there it is, Warren Buffett. Oh, excuse me. Warren Buffett probably has more quotes about investing than anybody else that I know, at least that are published we know rule number one, never lose money, and rule number two, never forget rule number one. That's a, a, a very popular quote. But by the way, he obviously does not mean never lose money like a bear market, you lose money, because four times over the last, uh, what, 50 years approximately, uh, he has lost about half of the value of his portfolio. So. When he talks about never lose money, he's talking about long term. And the other two quotes I have here, I think, are, are, are great ones because I run into so many parents who will say that they want their kids to learn how to invest and they need to make some mistakes to, so that they'll learn. And, and of course, Buffett says, look, you're better off to learn from other people's mistakes than having to go through that. And by the way, lose some of those precious, precious early years of investing where that money can be worth a ton if it's handled prudently. But my favorite quote that really drives the work that we do, and that is, and he was talking about life, he wasn't talking about just investing, but you only have to do a very few things right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. And the fact is, that when we worry about bear markets costing us money, bear markets are not our problem because they have been temporary. Our problem is really making bad decisions, bad decisions that create permanent bear markets. And I'll talk about what a permanent bear market is in just a second. And so our job is to help people make good decisions that minimize, I use the word eliminate, and I, I looked at it this morning and I said, I can't eliminate 
these, uh, th these challenges that create permanent bear markets, but I can minimize them and that's what we're about. Now, let's talk about how we would go about trying to minimize and keep you from making a bad decision. If we just look at two investors, and let me pull up my, uh, my trusty pen here so I can point. If we had two investors, one, by the way, they're both investing uh, $6,000 a year for 40 years. One get eight, gets 8% 8 during the accumulation period and then retires and gets 6% and they take out four. That's the assumption. Person two makes a half a percent more during the accumulation period makes a half a percent more during the distribution period. Now, where does the final accounting go? How do we know how well or poorly we did in our performance? My answer is you got to wait until I die to know because I'm not going to know how we did, but I can tell you this, that when we look over the 40 year period, we find out that this person retired and they had 1.678 million getting the eight and the 6% there. And the other one had 1.924. So small advantage theoretically to the person who got the eight and a half percent. But then they start taking withdrawals. This is real. This is the outcome of all that saving. And person number one takes out 2.6 million from age 65 to 95. Remember, making 6%, taking out four. And person number two, takes out 3.2 million. And then the good times roll because we pass on and our children or charities get what's left over. And so look at the person who got the eight and six, they got 2.8 million left over. Whereas the person who got eight and a half and six and a half has 3.7 left over. Total difference between the first and the second person a million and a half dollars. You know what? Losing a million and a half dollars, or by the way, figuring out how to make an extra million and a half dollars, it goes both ways. There are sins of omission and sins of commission. But that to me is a permanent bear market. If you leave a million and a half on the table because you didn't do the simple things to protect yourself I think that's a permanent bear market. So where are the places that it is easy, easy, and never been easier, by the way, to eliminate those half a percent mistakes or half a percent improvements? Well, we got lower expenses versus high. A lot of people pay high. We know lower is better. We know lower turnover is better. I don't know an AAII member that doesn't believe that less turnover is better than more turnover. Lower taxes, that's a slam dunk. More equities. Now, more equities is not a matter of reducing risk. More equities is about taking more risk. But it's so easy by taking a little bit more risk to add a half a percent. And finally, it sounds strange today because when I was, when I was an early investor, I believe that the idea was to have a little bit of diversification, pick your favorite 10 stocks. Well, it turns out in the end, the academic evidence is the more diversification you have, the higher the expected rate of return, not less. So in our work at the foundation, we really focus in on three huge decisions. What equity asset classes should we have in our portfolio? That's a big decision. How much equity and how much fixed income? Another huge decision. That's maybe more a case of staying the course, but isn't staying the course a way that we think we will do better in the end? Absolutely. So that division of equity and fixed income is, is really golden. And then the choice of distribution strategies. Neither of the, none of the three of us are financial planners. My old firm has 15 financial planners. I never became a certified financial planner. But the bottom line is this part of the decision-making process 
does not require that you become a financial planner. It requires that you know a lot of numbers and then figure out what numbers that you trust. Well, let's talk about some numbers that I trust because I would like to figure out that make sure you have the right equity asset classes in your portfolio. And by the way, I don't think anybody's going to argue with my recommendations. Where we probably have a, a little discussion would be how much of the S&P 500 should we have that's compounded over the last 92 years at 9.9%. How much large cap value should we have that's compounded at 11.1? How much small cap blend that's compounded at 12? And how much in small cap value that's compounded at 13.2? Now, these, these numbers have come from a database of the indexes that have been developed by DFA. So just I noticed earlier there was a question about the source of these numbers. And certainly later, Daryl may want to weigh in and talk more about the building of these, of these tables. I want you also to see the losses. Anytime somebody asks me, what do you think the market's going to do next year? My answer is, well, I think the S&P will be up somewhere be between 54% or down somewhere better than 43%, somewhere in there is where it's likely to be in one year. Now, we shouldn't be thinking about one year. We all know that. And yet it's that year we need to get over to keep us going in order to, that, to earn the long-term premium that equities provide. But all of these equity asset classes are all very dangerous on a short-term basis. By the way, uh, Daryl has done some wonderful uh, tables uh, focusing on the four fund combo, building a portfolio, all US, no international here, but 25% each, small cap value, large cap value, small cap blend, and large cap blend, and I'll talk about that in a second. But if we're not gonna care about one year, how do we feel about 40 years? Well, that's starting to sound like a few people's re retirement planning, I suspect, if we have some 20-somethings uh, watching today. I hope so. But it also, uh, uh, it, it, could, it could apply to the 40 and 50-year-olds who are looking to early retirement. They're the part of that FIRE uh, group that, uh, the, that Chris was talking about. So when we look out over 40 years, and we look at every 40-year period since 1928, we find that the best for the S&P 500 was 12.5%. Now, that is an amazing long-term return. We all know that. But there was a period that the, that the compound rate of return was 8.9. What I find kind of interesting here is that if you look at the inflation-adjusted return it was 1% difference. One was about six and one was about seven adjusted for inflation. So not as broad as, as one would have, uh, have expected probably. So all of these asset classes have these really great times and these really bad times. But I like to look at this base, the, the, the combination of the four funds. So that not only do you get uh, some, some, some asset classes that have historically performed better, but very often you'll have a year that like small cap value does really well and the S&P 500 actually loses money. And so that is an important part of building a portfolio. It isn't just about having lots of individual companies. It's also about having a number of asset classes. So this to us is golden information and hidden in that 92 year period or these 52, 40 year periods are so many terrible, terrible things that happen to our economy, that happen to us politically or wars or, or, or all the things you could imagine that you wouldn't want to have in your portfolio. And now what do they do? They add the coronavirus. So we have a, a new one to have to worry about. But the bottom line is there's nothing new 
about bear markets. The reasons may be new, but bear markets are, are, are fairly typical. Well, let's, let's dig in here to the four fund combo. Uh, we study, and you're gonna see the 10 fund strategy here in just a second. But one of the things that I found uh, after I got out of the business in 2012, when my focus was trying to manage money for other people. And we would show people how to do it on their own. And then we did it for clients uh, as a business. Well, when I left the industry and I became just a teacher, uh, I found out that the 10 fund strategy is, is too much for a lot of people to handle. And you'll see that in, in just a second. But between the work that Chris did to create the, the two fund strategy, which I think is, is, is tremendous, Daryl also did the homework to put together the four fund strategy. And the basic difference is that the four fund has almost the same exposure to value, almost the same exposure to to, to large uh, and, and to growth. As the 10 fund, the difference is it's only the US. Now, what do we know? We know that if you put everything in the S&P 500 and you started with $100,000, that over that, that period from 1970 to 2019, it would have grown, not taking any money out, not putting any more money in to over $15 million. If you took 25% of the portfolio, put it into large cap value, keep the other 75 in the S&P 500, you would have added about a half a percent. Oh, hey, there's a half a percent right there. And you would have had 19 plus million instead of 15 million. And look at the standard deviation, virtually the same. But then add the small cap small cap blend, blend here and S&P 500, when we call those large cap blend and small cap blend, it means it's a combination of growth and value. So small cap blend over that same period of time. And now, we're, by the way, we're talking from 1970 here to 2019, that portfolio grew to 22.5 million almost and the standard deviation went up a little, and the compound rate of return went up a little, up three-tenths of 1%. Three-tenths of 1% is golden. One-tenth of 1% can mean a lot of money over many years. Now we add one more asset class so that we're now 25% each of all four of these asset classes and the compound rate of return for that 50-year period, 12.3%, with a total value of $32.5 million. Now, there is no risk in the past. I knew exactly, Daryl knew exactly what to show you, because we know this worked. And there is nobody, unfortunately, that knows what's gonna happen in the future. Will large cap beat small? Okay, we've got it. Will growth beat value? Maybe, in which case we got it. So it's not like it's ignoring those things that might jump out of the bushes and become number one because we don't know. But I think it is important that we always remember whenever somebody's making a presentation to you, there is no risk in the past because we always know what we should have done. Let's look. Let's look at the 10 fund strategy. And I'm going to basically do the very same thing. I'm going to start out with a portfolio. This is a 1970 to 2019 again with annual rebalancing. And what I want to show you here is starting down here with 100% portfolio one, that same 15.4 million. But now we're just going to add 10% large cap value. Just what I consider to be a baby step. So now it's 90% S&P 500 and 10% large cap value. And it nudges the return up 
two tenths of one percent. It nudges the volatility down just a bit. I mean, meaningless. It, it, it's the same for all practical purposes. But then we're going to add another baby step, 10% in small cap blend. And that adds another two tenths of 1%. And the standard deviation is still the same. And now there's 18 million plus in the pool. And then we add the small cap value. It adds three tenths of 1%. And now we're up to a compound rate of return, 11.3, making it worth 21, almost. $22 million, and then we add REITs, and the REITs nudge it one more time, one-tenth of one percent. Now, I'm all for the one-tenth of one percent because it did add another $700,000 to the pool. I'm all for that. But the other thing is, I think you know this, REITs don't necessarily go up and down at the same time as the S&P 500. And so, it's a good asset class to own. Now, somebody asked during Chris's presentation uh, or one of the questions that came through about, well, what about REITs for the future? I mean, if we all work from home, then uh, we're not going to need all those fancy offices, et cetera. Well, you know, there's always list A, the good news, and list B, the bad news for almost any investment that we might, we might take. So, um, that's the nature of the risk we take. But I would understand people who could throw the REITs out. You know, this is my ultimate buy and hold portfolio. This is not your ultimate buy and hold portfolio. And I'm going to explain why I call it the ultimate and see if you agree with me. Then I'm going to, in one fell swoop, so as to make this a smaller table, I'm going to dump four different international equity asset classes in the portfolio all at one time. And that adds six tenths of 1% as a group. Standard deviation jumps up a bit, but it's still not meaningful difference. And now you're up to about $29 million. You have approximately doubled the amount of money that you've had since doing that with the S&P 500 and having about 15 million. And then we throw one more 10% piece in, and that's the emerging markets. So at the end of this period of time, we got 12.6. Now you may not remember, but I will tell you that the, 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 the four fund strategy was 12.3. And is that worth trying to go after the extra three tenths of 1%? Well, if we knew the future, you'd all say yes, but it may be the four fund will do better than the 10 fund, one can't know. And I also show here an all value portfolio that a couple of years ago had better returns than portfolio seven, but the poor performance of value has now put it down into second place for now, who knows. So those tables I just shared with you are some of the work that we do in trying to help people select the equity asset classes. And hopefully, could you add more? You could add a dozen more, but you would wanna add asset classes, not companies, not sectors, because the sectors are in fact in there. But if you wanted to add penny stocks, I wouldn't, but you, you, you could could be a small part, I guess, but the odds are from everything I know about the past that that's not gonna improve your unit of risk, return per unit of risk. It's gonna increase your risk and probably lower your return. What about commodities? What about gold? Negative, I wouldn't, because there's no evidence that that is going to reduce your risk and raise your return. And I don't like asset classes that don't have a built-in upward trend as equities do, as equities in fact do. Gold is, it's, it's a great speculation, by the way. I just don't think it's a great long-term hold. So that's the kind of decision you have to make. But when I said that that was my ultimate buy and hold strategy, it doesn't mean I don't know how to make more money. I do know how to make more money, and so do you right now. 
what you do is you pair back the large. Have more, sm more small in your portfolio. You pair back the value. Have more value orientation in your portfolio. You could do that. And that could be your ultimate. I like the idea that the academics, I didn't pick these asset classes. People a lot smarter than I that have done a lot more research than I have picked those asset classes for us. And so they all have a history of doing okay. Large U.S. and international blend, small U.S. and international blend, large value, both U.S. and international, et cetera. I like the idea that there are all these little 10% baskets. So I am not depending on any one asset class to, uh, to, to meet all of our needs. Diversification, to the, the, the last level, as far as I'm concerned. And by the way, Chris made a comment. I'm gonna fix this right now. My, my retirement portfolio is half buy and hold. That half is 50% stocks and 50% bonds. So that's half of it. The other half uses market timing. But I don't believe that people should try doing market timing on their own. From everything I know about the history of individual investors, I do not know how to teach you to be a successful market timer. I do believe we can help you learn how to be a successful buy and holder. But to me, that's kind of the last step in terms of diversification. Half in buy and hold, Half in timing, half in large, half in small, half in U.S., half in international. That is the massive diversification I want. But to the extent that you go with the buy and hold strategy, you should have over 10,000 stocks in your portfolio. And all of them are of asset classes that have been a winner over long periods of time. The second thing that I said is so critical that we're working to help people make as good a decision as we can. That is how much in stocks and how much in bonds. This table you're seeing now, fine tuning table, is focusing on one asset class, the S&P 500. We've done the same table for the worldwide equity, 70% US, 30% fixed income, worldwide equity, the ultimate buy and hold, 50% US, 50% international. We've done it for all value. We've done it for the four fund combo. We have developed this table so you can, depending on what strategy you pick, can look at at least the history from 1970 through, 19, uh, through 2020. Here is the top part of that table. I want you to see what we've got here. We've got 100% bonds. We've got 10% equity, 90% bonds. We've got 20 equity, 30 equity, all the way over to the right where we are 100% in equity. And you can see one year at a time how bad bad was and how good good was. When you added bonds, for example, Let's say 50-50, my wife and I. I told you my wife and I are half in buy and hold. We happen to be in the 50-50 stock bond strategy. So I know that bonds did well in 1970. But I also know, I also know, and I want to be able to get rid of this, these pictures over here if I can. Well, maybe I can. Nope. I also know that stocks didn't do so well. So I know that the reason I got 9.7 because of less here were the 50-50 strategies because the bonds did well. And in 73 and 74, the bonds did so much better than the all equity portfolio. And to my wife and myself in retirement, living off of, I don't have a pension, it's social security and the money that we take out of these investments. So I don't want to take the loss of 50%, which is what both Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch have said. If you're not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't have your money in the stock market. I'm too old to lose half of my money. But you can see every year 
combinations of different. Now, here we go to the bottom of that table. And here's what I see at the bottom. Well, first of all, here's annualized returns. Notice as you move to the right and you add more equities, how the return goes up and it keeps going up and it keeps going up. Finally, 10.6% is the compound rate of return. Standard deviation, 15 in this particular study. But here's the worst three months, the worst six months. Here's the worst 36 months. In fact, here's a period that the annualized return for that 60 months was a negative 6.7. At 76, I cannot afford that. Well, maybe it's my kids can't afford that, but we're gone, but, but I don't want to do that. Maybe I could afford that, but I don't want to. I'm not all that happy about the 50-50, but I'll live with it. And I don't know when it's going to happen, but I do believe it'll happen again. I have always told investors, if you follow my advice, I guarantee one thing without question, you will lose money. And I want to know how much. And I want to know, when I was an advisor, how much you as an individual would be willing to lose. And the reason I think these tables are important to do it yourself investors is you're not working with an advisor. You're doing it yourself. And I want you to pretend I'm sitting across the table from you and I'm saying, are you ready for this? Oh, you're ready for it. How about your spouse? Is your spouse ready for this? These tables are meant to help you think through some pretty doggone big decisions. By the way, uh, this, this table, now, those other seven tables I talked about before, the fine-tuning tables, they're all up on our site. This table's going up, but it's not there yet. Daryl just, just got it done in the last week or so, but look what you got. You got 1970 through 2019. You can compare 19, I mean, the S&P 500 with the ultimate buy and hold worldwide with the four fund combo, 50-50. I would love, I mean, I, this may never happen, but wouldn't it be nice to be able to just open up and look at this comparison in the combination that's your favorite combination? We might get there someday, but I'd love to be able to easily compare these returns. And you can see one year at a time how different they can be. Uh, let me just pick one that's, that's wildly different here. Well, if we could look at 2000 through 2002, this is 50-50, by the way. Well, the S&P 500 lost a little money, but look at the ultimate buy and hold, 50-50. Or the four fund strategy, 50-50, better yet. Or we could look at 2008. None of them were any good at all. That was a year that the market took all equity asset classes down. That was not true in the 2000 through 2002 bear market. And here you can compare the worst periods. Now, I'm not expecting you to be able to see all these numbers. All I want you to know is that there are dozens of tables just like this that you can look at. These are tables that take the fine tuning results and plug them into the decision to retire in 1970. And you're going to retire with a million dollars. Well, if you don't have a hope in hell of having a million dollars, make it 500,000, divide by two, make it 100,000, divide by 10. But we decided to make it a big round number. By the way, I can remember when I came into this industry in the mid 60s, what was it that every young person wanted to have someday? A million dollars. I teach university class from time to time. Guess what the number is young people want today? A million dollars. Well, we all know that a million dollars today is a far cry from where it was in 1966. Anyway, anyway, here's what I've got. I've got the decision for you to retire in 1970 with a million dollars. I want you to see what happens one year at a time to that million dollars as you take out $40,000, and because this is a fixed distribution strategy, 
that $40,000 is each year going to be adjusted up by the amount of inflation. And if you go right to the bottom of this distribution column down here, you will see what it took in 2019 to replicate what $40,000 bought back in 1970. It takes $266,000. I gotta get that information to young people. They need to know that while we have lived through a period of very low inflation, there is another side to that coin that they are likely to see at some point in their life. Well, this distribution strategy allows you to see what you would have had, the value at the end of each year. Oh, well, let's look at 50-50 at the end of 1974. It was down to $941,276. If you were all in the S&P 500, and I know people who were all in equities and retirement, you would have been down to $718,268. I have worked with tons of couples when I was an advisor I rarely found anybody who was willing to, to, to buy into both of a couple. The idea of losing 30% of your money in retirement, that's what happened during that period. These are not returns that, that, that didn't really happen. Well, actually, to be fair, you didn't get Bogle's fund until 1976. So these are hypothetical 70 to 75. So you can see what happens at any, let's say you think you're gonna live for 30 years. You think you're gonna live for 40 years. You're a fire person who's retiring at 40 and gonna have 50 years worth of need for that money. Well, here's what it would have looked like over that 50 years. Remembering there's no risk in the past. There obviously was some risk here if you decided to have this last for 50 years because you got some points that ran out of money here. That's important. Now, here is one way to compare what you just saw. Daryl put together a table here that shows using the S&P 500, 50 equity, 50 fixed income, a $30,000 starting point, a $40,000 starting point, and a $50,000 initial distribution. There's a really important lesson on this page. You can see down here, how much money would you have left uh, at the end of 30 years? Uh, you would have had 2.38 million in distributions and you would have been left over, uh, would have had uh, 9.3 million left over. At 40%, you would have, uh, uh, you, there you would have had distributions of 3.17, a million because you took out 40,000 to start with instead of 30 and you had less left over 4 million here and let's follow the bouncing apple here the ball here here we are at the end of 1994 in the $50,000 distribution notice the value year end value is coming to a screeching halt and right over here uh, you this is where you move in with your children okay and that's a risk of taking out too much. That might be a reward, but I'm saying that if you're too aggressive with a fixed distribution, you could be in big trouble. And yet, my wife and I, we, we, we proudly, we, without any sense of any high risk, take out 5% a year. You're gonna see that in just a second. Now, here is another look at this fixed distribution before we move on to flexible. The assumption is you start with 40,000, the 50-50 stock bound mix, and we show what would have happened with the S&P 500, the ultimate buy and hold, the four fund combo. And you can see what was taken out, the distributions, and they were all the same because remember, it was a fixed 40,000, adjusted by the same inflation for every distribution strategy. What changed is the amount of money that was left over. With the S&P 500, you were left with, and I'm talking now about the 4% distribution, you were left with 2.7 million. With the ultimate buy and hold, you're left with 32 million. 
With the four fund, you're left with 22 million. Now, you, you're not gonna sit there and take a little bit of money out when you're sitting on that much money as you're getting old. I mean, I, I understand that, but this is just for testing purposes. This is what my wife and I have done. And many of the people that follow our work have done. First of all, I worked until I was 70. And I know a lot of people that worked until they were 60 or younger. But one thing I wanted to be sure that I did, because I'm a very defensive guy, very cautious, always afraid of the future. That's my nature. My wife says she knows that if she suggests doing something, I will immediately come up with 10 reasons why we probably should think twice about it. That's just who I am. And so the thing I like about this flexible distribution strategy is that it does a defensive thing that is, I just think is amazing when you see the bottom line. What it does, and remember, it starts with me working extra years or anybody, however they get there, they have more money than they need to retire. I wanted to have at least two to one what I needed. So if by chance, my cost of living was 40,000, and I could have done it with a million and adjusted for inflation, I wanted to be conservative. I, let's say I saved $2 million instead of one. I still had the same cost of living, but now I could take in theory 4% of 2 million or live on 80,000. I could do more traveling. We could give more money away. We could help children and charities and all of those things that sometimes it's just a lot of fun in retirement. So this is a very different strategy. You're not adjusting your annual distribution to inflation. You are adjusting it to how much money you have. So when the market goes down like it did in the early 70s, and what I'm looking at here is the S&P 500, 50% 50 bonds, 50% stocks, it got down to a distribution of 43,800. Well, that's a lot lower number than what you needed if you had adjusted that 40,000 that you took out in 1970 for inflation. But remember, if I saved twice what I needed, I'm protected from inflation. I don't have to worry about inflation anymore. And so there are, again, dozens of tables that you can look at for different combinations, worldwide, all value, for fund. It, it, my hope is that it's, it's, it's enough to investigate that you will find something that you, you will have peace of mind about. So here is, just with the S&P 500, the 30%, the, the 30,000, the 40,000, the 50,000 uh, starting amounts, but not adjusting for inflation, simply taking a percentage, 5% of the, for example, of the previous year-end balance. Oh, and I should note, my wife and I, we take our money out at the beginning of each year. That's, in a sense, our way of budgeting, how much we have to either live on or give away, whatever it might be. And so why do we take it at the first of the year? Wouldn't we have more money to leave our children later in life if we took it out monthly instead of at the first of the year because that would give more money, more time to grow? Yes, that's true. But there's a peace of mind thing that we like. We like to have that money in when we put it in a short-term, a Vanguard short-term uh, corporate or a short-term investment grade bond fund. And some years we do well in that fund. Some years we don't do so well, but it's better than a money market fund and very, very little risk. And then we take the money out monthly. I, we don't have to worry about the market going up and down during that period of time that we're taking it out. So, and you can imagine this year, think about that. We got our money first week of the year, nothing to worry about in terms of getting money this year. Now, had we not, 
then we would have been probably trying to second guess the market month to month. Should we take it now, et cetera? So that is how we do it. And, and uh, I know lots of people who have three years of money set aside uh, in no risk investments. But you can see the bottom line number here of the, of the 3%, 4%, and 5%. Oh, wait a minute. Look at this. Over here, under the 50,000, remember when it was 50,000 adjusted for inflation, there were no values in this final column? Well, look, it goes right to the bottom. There is actually money left over, and you were able to enjoy a, a bigger distribution early in life. Remember, it suggests that also you had oversaved. And here is a look at all three of these uh, uh, major portfolios, uh, S&P 500. This is all gonna be 40,000 beginning and a variable, dis flexible distribution using a 50-50 stock bond portfolio. And you can see what happened here. You can see what's left over at the uh, end of 30, not so different. 40, uh, 6.6 million left over on the uh, S&P 500, uh, 12.5 million left over at the uh, end of uh, the, the 40 years from the ultimate buy and hold, and uh, 10 million from the four fund combo. So you can slice and dice many ways, many ways. And one final table, we got a bunch of these too. I think we have eight of them. But this is a sample. I'm hoping these samples will drive you, drive you to our website to, to learn about all of this information that Daryl has turned out. Powerful stuff. Here was the assumption, $1,000 a year starting in 1970. Monthly, $83.33. Every year, it's increased by 3%. And as Chris said, when you're adding money, see there's two sources of the growth of the money that we have for retirement. One is the money we put in, and two, it is the growth. So at the end of a year that we've put $1,000 in, it goes up 10%, let's say. And it didn't go up 10% in the last month. It probably went up 10% a little. I don't know how it went up. But let's say you ended up with $1,100 for the sake of discussion here. $100 came from the market. $1,000 came from you. So if you happen to start right at the beginning of a market that is not treating you well, it is the money you're putting in because every year, almost every year, you have more than the previous year. But of course, and, and by the way, I think it's fascinating to be able to look at, at uh, how much you had at the end of the first 10 years, 100% stock, that's where you should be. You would have had $16,245. 10 years later, you got 119, almost 120,000. Then you got 699,000. And then you run right into one of the worst decades. In fact, even a worse decade than 1929 through 1938. The S&P 500 loses money, totally. Um, you didn't lose everything, but that you did not come out ahead, even with the money you added at the end of the next decade. You could have thrown in the towel and I wouldn't have have questioned that because how can you live through that and, and go on because it looks like whatever you thought it was going to do it didn't do and then the next 10 years it did it in spades now again there is no risk in the past i know exactly when these things happen it may be that you will for example from 1975 to 1999 the S&P 500 compounds at 17.2%. I don't blame anybody 
1999 thinking the S&P 500 is the answer for all of your money. And then for the next 20 years, you make about five and a half percent. Now, what's wrong with that picture? Well, there's nothing wrong with that picture for the market because the market doesn't care how old you are, what your needs are. It just what it is what it is given conditions that we can't predict. And so you would like to have that golden age from 1975 to 1999 back. You may get it from here on. I don't know. I do know that's the golden age I grew up during. And I have a lot of friends who thought they were really great investors back then. And I was probably one of them. Well, I wasn't, it was the market. I have yet to ever make a penny for an investor, not one penny. The, the market makes you the money. I can try to get you to put your money into index funds with low expenses and low taxes and low turnover and, and do all of that. That I can, I can encourage you to do, but I can't make the market go up. I guarantee it. So here's the fixed contribution asset allocation. This is with the S&P 500 for different levels of risk. What I want to do is I want to look for one second at this one. Uh, these are the S&P 500 ultimate, ultimate buy and hold four fund combo, 80-20. And here's what I know. In all cases, you put in $112,797. For the S&P 500, you were left with 1.9 million. 2.7 for ultimate buy and hold and 2.9 for the four fund combo. And of course, if you put your money in the five, the uh, small cap value, I think it was something like 7 million, which by the way, I don't recommend for your whole portfolio, but I wouldn't think it's a bad idea to do it with a thousand dollars a year. I want you to know that all those tables that I talked about can be found under best advice. The distribution tables, the contribution tables, the fine tuning your asset allocation, and the ultimate buy and hold. And then over here under ETFs, I'll tell you why I want you to go in and, and, and look at the ETF recommendations because Chris has written some very good articles, meaningful articles, about how he selected those best in class uh, ETFs. And by the way, it's important to note those best in class ETFs are all available at Vanguard and uh, Fidelity, I think at Schwab, uh, I don't remember, but I think um, as, as commission free trades. And as I said when I was talking on Chris's uh, presentation, I do think that partial shares will be available soon. And then we have free books. And we have what I think is a really great book for first time investors coming out in the next couple of months. It's about $12 million decisions and two funds for life. And it's very simple. It's a quick read. Each chapter is about a thousand words. It is not meant to help engineers get better, okay? But I think it makes the proper case for target date funds and a lot of other things that are in your best interest. And everybody who is on our list of our newsletter, which is free, will get a free copy of that new book when it comes out. It will be an ebook, obviously. And my hope is that you will find it meaningful enough and easy enough to understand that every young person that you know will get a copy of it. You can, you'll be able to forward that copy to them. There's no reason you'll be able to go to, to Amazon to buy it if you must, but you don't have to. And, uh, 
And I think that is, uh, oh, and one last item. When I say this, I want you to know, I'm not begging, but I am at least telling you that we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we survive uh, almost entirely on the donations that I have made because it is my life's work that I am trying to extend here, but we are able to do more if, um, if, if people uh, are willing to help us. Uh, I don't take out any income, Chris, and Dale doesn't take out any income. Uh, this truly is a labor of love, but we do appreciate your help. And with that, Rob, what do you want to do now? Thanks, Paul. Um, well, we've got about 10 or 12 minutes okay. uh, left. Uh, I know Chris has been answering some questions online. Chris, why don't I turn it over to you? You've gone through the Q&A list. Um, are there some questions you have for Paul? Oh, I haven't been through the whole list. It's quite a list. Oh. Um, so. May I just, uh, I'll just interject something here, Rob. We will take this list and we will do a special podcast. And what we can't get to in the next 10 minutes, we will try to address every one of them. We'll forward it to you. And if you have the ability to forward it to the people who came out here today, they will get it. Okay? So, Paul, Sounds like it. How about I read a few of these to you? Sure. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start with, it's anonymous attendee, but it's the kind of question that uh, I think will resonate with your experience as a financial advisor. Writing from Pennsylvania, USA, 54-year-old female trying to get retirement together after a divorce 13 years ago. When you get to questions and answers, I've been listening to Paul's podcast since December as it was recommended by a coworker three years ago. I've switched almost all to safe funds since I don't like where all of this is going and, I, and have felt that way since the last election. Needless to say, I have not made out as well as others in the last three years. I still feel, especially with the graph showing how our government is buying debt, that things are not going in the direction as tables show on Paul's podcasts. I would like to retire in 10 years or less. What is the safest way to invest if I want no risk? Not sure of the two funds for life strategy, you know, kind of please help. Well, obvious problem is there is no, no risk way to do it unless you save a massive amount of money. Um, and, and, and I may just add to that. If this lady saves a massive amount of her earnings and she doesn't have a whole bunch of money at the point that she gets to retirement, one thing she may have to do in order to give her the income she needs out of that money is to convert a lot of it to a single premium life annuity that is the essence of the same thing as social security or a pension with a corporation. It is a guarantee to give you a monthly income. Now, to the extent that she goes to the fine tuning table that we've presented, and evidently she knows about the other fine tuning tables, then she could see how she might feel about being 40% in, uh, in equities and 60% in fixed income. That certainly isn't guaranteed. And then if she wanted to make it a one fund solution and have it be a 40-60, uh, Vanguard has a 40-60 life strategy fund. They have a Wellesley Fund, which is a great fund that, that she could be in. And yes, in, in 2008, the Wellesley Fund went down less than 10%, but it's been around since 1970, and I think it's compounded at 6 or 7%. That's better than sitting in a CD, but she's going to have to belly up to the bar here and understand she's going to have to take some risk or she's going to have to work longer. I worked longer. Maybe she would like to work longer. That's the trade-off. And Daryl, I can see it in your eyes. What advice would you give? Daryl? Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think your advice is spot on. Um, it's a tough situation to be in when you're 
when you're getting closer and closer to retirement and you and you're in that kind of a situation hard decisions or hard hard decisions need to be made or taken and and i it's hard i think well, let me add, let me add. all in all in one fund is a good solution because like the life strategy funds because you don't have to fuss with it to to keep it up that's in fact what what my plan is for my wife if i should die first but um but for someone who's not not wanting to spend the time to manage a, a two or a four or a 10 fund portfolio, a one fund solution with a, a lower uh, equity uh, allocation is, is probably a, a good way to go. Chris, Ready you want to add in? Paul? Sure. Okay. Uh, Buffett, this is from Santosh. Uh, Buffett says diversification is for ignorant and he made the wealth with only a few stocks. What is your take on that, Paul? I think he's uh, absolutely, he's right spot on. I would totally agree with him, but I can tell you this. He also says and recommends, and he says this, been saying this for decades, for individuals and professionals alike, the best investment they can make is the S&P 500. And let's talk about the ignorance. You know, there, there, there is a circle of information that we can know about in investing. And there's a pie graph in there. There's the, the pie graph has a piece that represents what we know we know. And what I know I know about investing is not very much. I am an ignorant man when I realize all of the stuff I could know, but I know some stuff that I think is pertinent. Then there's a piece of pie that represents what I know I don't know, and that's the future. Then there's a piece that represents what I don't know I don't know. And since I don't know it, I have no idea how big that piece of pie is. Then there's a piece that represents what I know I know, but I'm wrong. And that's a problem a lot of us have, me included. Then there's what I know I know, but I don't do anything about it. And so my feeling is most of us are really basically ignorant about all the stuff we have to deal with, which is why we all recommend massive diversification with low expenses, et cetera, right amount of fixed income and equity, et cetera, to do it right. We are all pretty doggone ignorant. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come up on the thread about different portfolios. So um, one of them was about the Trev H portfolio at uh, Bogleheads. Um, but here, I'll give you a different one. No, no, no. Why don't you take that one, Chris? Well, I, I did actually. I answered that one well, online for but people. Share, so, share that. So, I'd like to hear what you said. I, well, the, the short answer is there's, you know, if, if you look at it from a back testing standpoint, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, uh, it, it performs quite similarly to what the four fund portfolio that Daryl and, and Paul have put up on the website uh, performs. It's a little bit more diversified geographically. The reason we haven't analyzed it and put it on the website is that there aren't asset class data going back to 1970. So it's not, it's not that it's a bad portfolio. It's just there isn't as much data to validate it. But if you look where there is data, it, it performs well, and it doesn't have the geographic concentration that the all U.S. portfolio has. So I think it's a, I think it's a good strategy. The, um, let's see, uh, are these numbers and returns including subtracting for fees? Go ahead, Daryl. Yes. <laughs> the the ultimate buy and hold numbers uh and the and the flavor of the four fund portfolio that starts in 1970 uh are basically made up of funds that existed either at the time or exist now um in some cases early on we had to use index data to fill out the asset classes as, as far back as we could go uh towards 1970 and when we did that we subtracted uh, from the from the uh, total return an, an amount that was equivalent to an expense ratio for that kind of an asset class. So the answer for the four fund combo and ultimate buy and hold portfolios from 1970 on is yes. Um, the four fund combo, even from 1928 through 2019, we used pure indexes for all of that time period just to be able to get asset class data for the whole range. 
in that case, we also subtracted a representative expense ratio from the total return, uh, annual total returns of those indexes. So, yes, they reflect Thanks, the expense ratios. So, uh, Paul, another question that came up a lot. Uh, with bond returns as miserable as they have been lately, has that altered your thinking on the percentage of a portfolio that should be devoted to bonds? Well, I'll make it a, a quick answer. I own bonds, and most people that follow our work own bonds as a defensive uh, a position. It's a diversification away from equities. And so the bonds are there to try to pr protect the portfolio. And, and, and the bonds that we recommend this year have had a pretty good return. I think, um, I think it's pretty close to three and a half percent so far, or maybe four percent this year, uh, just this far into the year. And, and, uh, and that's because when there's a catastrophic event, it's very common for there to be a rush to fixed income. And the rush tends to be more to the highest quality fixed income. By that, I will just add, one of the reasons I think the S&P 500 uh, as, an, as an equity asset class is doing so well this year compared to others, it is the rush to quality there if you wanna look at it that way versus small cap and value, et cetera. But people, who want income from bonds. We have a monthly income bond portfolio that is, uh, uh, is on our website. That's a different need, but my portfolio, it's there for stability and I still want it there for stability. Do we have time for one more, Rob? Uh, sure. Why don't we take one last question and um, then we'll work on getting uh, whatever podcast you put together uh, out to the rest of the attendees to get the rest of the questions answered. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I'm going to take this one. Why do you recommend ETF DLS with a 0.58% expense ratio? Um, the short answer is history says uh, that it's worth it and it's worth it for two reasons. Number one, um, that fund has good factor exposure to factors that have a long history of delivering uh, a premium, a higher return. And number two, um, it actually has proven it. If you, if you look at the history of the return relative to other funds available in that asset class, it has, it's performed the way you would expect. That doesn't necessarily mean it's outperformed the market as a whole or any other asset class, it means that within that asset class, it's delivering what it's supposed to deliver. And if you want to know more about how I decide whether an expense ratio is worth it or not, there's a long article about how I choose best in class funds on Paul's website. And there was also an article that ran in the AAII magazine that talked about the process I use. So um, bottom line, it's worth it. So. And if I may add one last uh, item, Rob, uh, I think, and I'm going to speak for these gentlemen, I think what we ought to do is the three of us ought to get together and, and do a Zoom uh, a discussion so that it can have the same flavor as, as what we've done here today. Would that be okay for you, Rob? Uh, but sure. Well, and we can certainly chat about how to coordinate something uh, following the meeting. Um, but uh, certainly appreciate uh, the three of you jumping on the call uh, today and educating our members. And, and looks like we had quite a few members from around the country and, and, and possibly around the globe uh, from what I can tell. So thanks so much for sharing your, your in-depth knowledge and experiences. Um, just a couple of reminders. Uh, you will get, everyone will receive an email um, about uh, 24 hours from the beginning of this, this session with a link to the recording and the presentations, which will all be posted on our local chapter website. Uh, please, if you can, when you leave the meeting today, take a few minutes to fill out that survey for us. We'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. And then uh, keep uh, in touch um, with a uh, follow-up to this session so we can get some of these questions answered for you. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, yeah, for, uh, thanks for coming. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a great weekend. Thanks.